Yo, I'm Q Harrison. This is the Sports Card Strategy Show with your man, Paul Hickey. What's good? No offseason. When you get into this game, the reason why you pay someone like Paul Hickey to get your sports card strategy together is because sometimes when you're starting out, you need perspective. You need wisdom. You need insights. And so he's been around the track enough times where he can actually coach you up and guide you. Doesn't mean he's going to take you to the promised land tomorrow. But you now have a coach by your side that can advise and kind of even create these pathways where you can get the education yourself. And that's a lot better than thugging it out on your own. What's up, everybody? I'm Paul Hickey with NoOffSeason.com. This is the Sports Card Strategy Show. Don't forget to get a free 30-day trial at NoOffSeason.com today to help you make money flipping sports cards build your sports card investment portfolio, get unlimited advice from our experts, and take sports card school to navigate the hobby. That's nooffseason.com. Get your free 30-day trial today. All the data we use on the Sports Card Strategy Show is from marketmoversapp.com. Use code nooffseason at marketmoversapp.com to get 20% off for life after a free 14-day trial. All right, let's get to the sports card strategy. What's up? What's up? It is Monday, July 1st. Welcome to July. It's the month of the national. So we are getting excited for the national 2024 coming up at the end of this month in Cleveland, Ohio. And we are talking with Ray Schulte. If you don't know who Ray Schulte is, He's like the face of the national, well-respected in the hobby, well-respected in sports cards, memorabilia, and sports business, sports marketing. We got a great interview with Ray towards the end of today's show. Uh, but we're also going to talk about some of the top uh, raw to grade opportunities via the formula because it is Monday. We're going to talk about what is the best way to auction off a five-figure card and today's question of the day is, are you going to the National? Drop a comment below at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. We would love to see you in Cleveland, Ohio. Our team is going to be there. I'm going to be there. Lefty McKee is going to be there. In Turner is going to be there. And many other members of the nooffseason.com fam are going to be there. So get pumped for the National. Are you going to the National is today's question of the day. Drop a comment below at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. Are you ready to start grading your favorite cards? CGC Cards is the perfect place to slab your favorite sports cards. From their crystal clear holders to their affordable pricing, CGC Cards is the perfect stop for your grading needs. Go to cgccards.com to start grading today. All right, let's jump into some amazing opportunities to make money buying cards raw and grading them per the formula. We've got a plethora of different sports today. We got some baseball prospects, some football quarterbacks, some football position players, even some backup quarterbacks. Let's start with the card that can make you the least amount of money on today's episode, but it's still a 23% overall ROI, which is phenomenal. This is what you get when you come to the Sports Card Strategy Show and NoOffSeason.com. A prospect that our very own Lefty McKee has talked about for a long time and really likes this year, Carson Williams. Carson Williams is two, 2021 Bowman Draft Chrome Refractor First Auto. So this is out of four ninety nine Refractor First Auto. High upside in a PSA 10 selling for around $248, but you can buy into this card raw for 104 and make a 23% ROI on this card based on the grades you're likely to get. So go to the formula-based sports card rankings at nooffseason.com. Find the link to this Carson Williams 2021 Bowman Draft Chrome Auto Refractor first and go search for one on eBay that's gradable. See if you can snipe it for the target cost of $104. And... You can make 23% on this card, just raw to grade. All right, moving up the list here, you can make 24% ROI just buying Bryce Young, the first overall pick in the 2023 NFL draft, his Prism Silver 311 for a target cost of $70. 
Upside in the PSA 10 right now is 213. I think that's going to rise, actually. Good gem rate on this card. You can actually make money, barely make money on a PSA 9, which is great. 24% ROI on Bryce Young, raw to grade, 2023, Prism Silver, 311. Now let's talk about a position player, Devon A. Chain. His 2023 Prism 365 Silver, Silver Prism, $4 raw, $4 raw. So you don't need the 70 that it takes to get the Bryce Young. You definitely don't need the 104 that it takes to get the Carson Williams. You just need $4. And the upside in the PSA 10 right now on the silver Devon A-chain is 58 bucks. High gem rate on this card, so the formula loves it. 30% ROI on the Devon A-chain. And I think that, like the Bryce Young, has the potential to go up during the NFL season, which would be even better. All right, CJ Stroud, his 2023 Prism Silver Raw. This is an expensive card, $311 target cost, but there's still upside of $867 in a PSA 10, $291 in a PSA 9. Doesn't kill you right now. 33% ROI on the Stroud Silver Prism Raw. So I love the upside on that one. A little bit risky, but high upside. All right, next let's go to another running back. I've talked about this guy in previous episodes. I love Bijan Robinson this year. His 2023 Prism 305 rookie variation silver has a buy-in target cost of $21 right now. High upside in a PSA 10 at $133 and a PSA 9 price of $30 that doesn't kill you. So there's a 40% ROI on the Bijan Robinson card of his silver prism variation. All right, let's go back to baseball for a minute before we wrap up with my favorite backup quarterback of the year to buy raw and grade. All right, back to baseball. Ethan Salas, his 2023 Bowman Chrome first prospect auto raw target costs $77. You can get it for that. 305 in a PSA 10, high gem rate, 72% ROI. That's massive. 72% ROI for the Padres catching prospect. Up next, a name that Lefty and I have argued about in the past. Lefty doesn't like this guy as a baseball player. I don't care about him as a baseball player because the the numbers make sense on this guy and there's going to be some hype around him because he has the name recognition. That's right. It's Drew Jones. The second overall pick in the 2022 MLB draft behind Jackson Holiday has not got the call up yet to the Diamondbacks. Drew Jones, his 2023 Bowman Chrome first prospect auto, buy in point raw, 50 bucks, high upside in a PSA 10 of 217. And the PSA 9 doesn't kill you at 71 bucks. So 88% ROI on the Drew Jones. You can find this card. That's massive ROI. We don't see that very often in the formula. So raw to grade, Drew Jones, Bowman Chrome first prospect auto, 88% ROI. This is what's great about it. You don't need a selling marker. It doesn't matter how good of a baseball player he is. You just buy raw grade and immediately flip and you make money. Okay, speaking of that, you can do that with my favorite backup quarterback entering the 2024 NFL season. Third round pick of the Detroit Lions last year, Hendon Hooker. Hendon Hooker, his 2023 Prism Silver Variation, 21% or $21 target cost, 21% ROI also. $21 target cost. Upside in a PSA 10 is 90 bucks. PSA 9 doesn't kill you. And, you know, you can absolutely... So the PSA 9 is 26 bucks. So that doesn't kill you. So you can make 21% ROI on this low entry level card of the rookie variation prism silver. Now the rookie prism silver for Hendon hooker. So the 2023 prism silver has an $8 buy-in target cost right now. And the same upside with a PSA 10, even better upside of the PSA 10, $94 PSA nine doesn't kill you at 23 bucks either. So the formula loves this card, 38% ROI. So this doesn't, this is not even dependent on whether or not he plays. This is not dependent on Jared Goff's health. This is just Hendon Hooker by raw grade. People like him. The hobby likes him enough. They're prospecting him on on him enough that his PSA 10 has this massive upside. Now, one more card with the most ROI from a Hendon Hooker standpoint per the formula. 
His 2023 Prism 315 rookie variation, no huddle. If you can find this for nine bucks, that's the target cost. Upside in a PSA 10 is 64. That's a 59% ROI because there's an 88% gem rate on this card. So find a gradable version. The formula likes it. And speaking of finding a gradable version of things, we've talked on the show before about card prep. We talked about pre-grading. Card prep is massive in the hobby. A lot of us do it. We have information on it at Sports Card School. And I have special information for you here on July 1st. We have kicked off a partnership with MrMinty.com. Talked about it last week. MrMinty.com. Use promo code NOOFFSEASON for 15% off on your entire order at MrMinty.com. Mr. Minty also has... Uh, card prep and submission services. More details on mrminty.com. But definitely, we want you to use that promo code no off season for 15% off of your order at mrminty.com. His, his, uh, basically, his card prep products are what you want to put in your cart and buy with that promo code no off season. Uh, help you just prep your cards for grading, grading them raw and submitting them to PSA to make money per our formula. All right, real quick, it's time for Will It Gem. So I have a new strategy here. Typically on Will It Gem, I am basically showing you guys all the cards that I plan on grading at PSA. My strategy has always been, look, I'm going to buy it raw. It's going to be part of everything that I'm doing, and I'm going to submit it regardless of its chance at gemming. But I'm questioning that strategy now and I'm thinking with a card like this, and I bought a lot of this card, just a ba- just a simple base prism, CJ Stroud, number 339, nothing special about it other than the fact that it's CJ Stroud. This card continues to go for around between $20 and $25. And our guy Andy Kaysen over at the Football Card Quest thinks that this is going to be a card that you can sell raw, you can flip this raw during the 2024 NFL season based on C.J. Stroud's performance and the Houston Texans' performance. What do you all think? I think that this card is perfectly centered on the front, perfectly centered up, down, left, right on the front, but on the back, it looks a little off-center to me. What do you think? Will it gem? Should I send it to PSA? Or should I do Andy Kaysen's strategy of maybe just flipping it raw during the NFL season because it is CJ Stroud. Multiple options there. Multiple options. The formula like this likes this card. I don't think it's uh, a lose either way, but I want it to be a win. I want it to be a win. So let me know what you think I should do by dropping a comment below at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. And let me know what you do. What do you do when you get a card and you buy it online and you think it's going to gem and that's part of the plan and then you get it and you're like, wait a minute, I don't think this is going to get a PSA 10. Do you send it in anyway with the chance of getting a PSA 10 or just with being okay getting a nine and flipping it? Or do you hold it raw and then try to just sell it raw? I want to know what you do because you out there in the audience are very intelligent sports card investors. I love every single one of you in the nooffseason.com fam. All right, before we get into our amazing interview with our guy Ray Schulte of the National. Yes, he's a big wig. So, we were we were definitely excited to have him on the show. Before we get in and talk to Ray about how excited we are about the National 2024 later on this month. What is the best way to auction off a five-figure card? We've talked about this, we've debated it on the show. Five-figure card would obviously be anything over $9,999.99, right? So we're talking about a $10,000 card and above. And I've thought eBay quite a bit. I've thought that you could you could definitely do this on eBay and you can make a lot of money doing it on eBay because they have the biggest audience. But there's also auction houses out there. And I think the number one auction house, if you're going to pick an auction house outside of eBay, would be PWCC. My friends at Roadshow Cards agree with me. And we are partnering with Roadshow Cards to bring our listeners at the Sports Card Strategy Show a very unique and awesome opportunity to help you get the most possible for your higher dollar cards. All you have to do is email paul at nooffseason.com 
for details. This is a great deal for sports card strategy listeners. So if you've got cards out there, it doesn't have to be a five-figure card. If you're nervous about auctioning off your cards and you need help, this could be any card $200 or more. But the higher the value of the card, the better on this one for all of us. So email paul at nooffseason.com and I'm going to get right back to you with information on this very special opportunity courtesy of our great friends at Road Show Cards. All right, it is time, without further ado, to bring in my new friend Ray Schulte to the show of The National. Let's get excited for The National in Cleveland later this month. If you're not already excited, I think this interview might do it for you. Now I'd like to welcome into the Sports Card Strategy Show a new friend, Ray Schulte. Ray uh, does many, many things in the hobby. And uh, Ray, welcome to the Sports Card Strategy Show and the NoOffSeason.com family. It's great to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's an honor to have you, man. I know you you kind of been making the rounds, uh, getting ready for you know, probably one of the biggest events on your calendar of the year, I would imagine, the National. Um, everybody in our audience is obviously familiar with it. But before we get into that, you know, tell us quickly a little bit more about who you are, your background, and, and what your role is in the hobby. Oh, sure. That's a great question. Um, you know, I started out back in, in the early 80s. Um, um, my background is with, uh, with advertising, branding, marketing, promotion. Um, I worked for two ad agencies in New York. At the time, they were separately, they were the biggest ad agencies in the world. And so I come from a real discipline, packaging, promotional background. And uh, I broke off in the early 80s, really, because I wanted to package an athlete just like I package a, a box that was on the retail store. And uh, I got, uh, I was very fortunate. I got to meet uh, Pete Maravich. And uh, Pete, uh, I, I, he asked me you know, what my, my vision was, what my, what my thoughts were. And I told him, he goes, well, you know, Ray, if I had somebody like you, I'd be a million dollars richer. Because, you know, he had his dad and he, he had a, uh, their attorney in Louisiana. And that was it. Everything was focused on the game. And so, you know, I said, Pete, that's what I want to do. I want to package an athlete. And uh, so he, he said, I, I think I can help you. And he introduced me to a partner of his. He had a basketball camp in Clearwater, Florida. And his partner was Jim Crevax. And Jim was All-American at Texas. He was, uh, you know, uh, the NIT uh, um, uh, MVP. And, uh, but he, he was representing baseball players. He had about 30 or 40 uh, young players. And I'll just throw out a couple of names. Some of you remember, some won't. But Spike Owen, Harold Reynolds, uh, uh, Alvin Davis, Howard Johnson. And, uh, and one of the guys that he represented was Don Mattingly. And since I was working out of New York and Donnie, it was like 83, 84, Donnie was just coming up into the majors. Um, you know, I, I said, you know, well, that's what I'd like to do. And so he said, go home, write a plan, come back and present it. And uh, I did, you know, back then we didn't have the ability we have today in terms of uh, Google and computers and all that. But it took me a couple of months. I went down, back down to Clearwater, presented a plan. And he said, hey, that's great. Let's go for it. Uh, and I went back to New York, quit my job, started my own agency, and uh, Mattingly was my first client. Now, granted, he was, you know, he was just starting out, and uh, we went through '84. He won the batting title, and then he won the MVP. And um, but uh, you know, there was so much more that I needed to do, had to do, and and licensing was really happening back in those days. I mean, that's when it really kind of exploded. So there was a lot of you know. Um, due diligence, research, uh, conversations with uh, the MLBPA, the Major League Baseball. And um, so I got, to, I got to know them pretty well. And I got to know a lot of agents because we collaborated a lot and uh, we, we traded information. And that was, that was kind of the way that kicked my, year, my, my career off, basically. Um, you know, I went on to represent uh, a few other athletes. Uh, I was fortunate. Major League Baseball asked me to con have them con me consult with them. Um, we, we actually we put together the first Fan Fest, the Major League Baseball All-Star Fan Fest in Toronto. 
in uh, 90, was it 91? And, um, and so, you know, from there, I, I, I met the Clemente family. They asked me to represent them and it kind of evolved and it kind of grew. And I was just very fortunate um, to where I uh, started working with not only Donnie, but Buck Showalter, Steve Carlton, and a number of others. So, uh, and then consulting with all the leagues. I started working with the NHL, the NBA, the NFL, and uh, it, was a, it was a great opportunity for me. And, and then it led on to other things. I, you know, I started working with Cal Ripken. I represented Cal for 10 years and uh, John Riggins for five years and Josh Gibson for 10 years. And uh, so that was my background. And then one day in Cleveland, uh, back a decade or so ago, uh, Mike Burkus um, and I uh, ran into each other at, at a national in Cleveland. And he said, listen, you're representing Cal, you were, you're living in Baltimore. Hey, would you want to be involved with the national? And at that time, I was, I just had a son and I was, you know, kind of in between doing what I wanted to do. And I said, sure. And so I started working with, um, with Mike and my first uh, national was in Baltimore, 2010. And from there, uh, you know, it was really only meant to be one year, but uh, it's now now going into Cleveland. It's been 14 years now. So, uh, I, I, and people ask me, why do you why do you still do it? Well, um, the answer is, I love the community. I love the collecting concept. I love the mindset. I love everything about that. And so. You know, whereas I don't necessarily trade modern cards or vin even vintage cards, I used to, but not anymore. I collect movie posters. But that mentality, that mindset for me has kind of just you know, kept me in the game. And, and I just enjoy working with everybody out there and, and seeing how everything evolves. So, you know, that basically is, is how I ended up to where I am today. And, uh, you know, again, we started out, I'd say, 2019, you know, we, were, we generated a lot of interest, you know, with the National in Chicago. And then obviously the pandemic in 2020. Uh, but we went from 50,000 attendees to now over 100,000 attendees last year in Chicago. And so the industry has evolved. And, and that's exciting for me because I love to see, you know, new technology. I love to see new uh, entries into the category. Um, you know, us getting the industry getting involved in pop culture, Pokemon, the international scene. Uh, it, it, it fascinates me. It, it gets me excited. And I, I love sharing that with uh, with our industry and our community. Amazing story. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, have a ton of respect for you, your background, your hard work, creativity, the vision, right? The execution. I mean, kind of all coming together. Obviously, phenomenal timing in terms of kind of when you were able to to make your break into working with professional athletes and and have done a, an amazing job for the last 40 years right so so that's oh, incredible you. um and and in terms of the national itself i mean our entire audience is super familiar from an overall standpoint with the national i would say that a good chunk of our audience has been to at least one event this will be my third national in a row and you know to, to the point you made a minute ago, I mean, I saw just even from Atlantic City in 22 to Chicago in 23, it felt more massive. Like it, like like Chicago in 23 felt almost twice the size, just anecdotally, <laughs> as Atlantic City did. And what kinds of things are you most excited about for Cleveland this year? Well, I, I love the momentum. I mean, for me, you know, I just see and I feel that momentum from a, an exhibitor standpoint, from a partner standpoint, and from an attendee standpoint. And, you know, it, it, we've done some questionings, we've done some you know, research, and, and, and it just really confirms what I mentioned earlier. It's all about community. You know, it really is. It's all about um, networking. It's all about, you know, the nationals, um, Mike Burkus said this a long time ago. He said, you know, if you can't find that the national doesn't exist. Well, because of that, everybody is there to kind of, you know, find out what, you know, again, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a card, whether it's a, you know, a meet and greet, whatever it may be, 
you're going to find something that's going to get you excited and hopefully something that creates a memory for you for a lifetime. Yeah, that's a great point. I think not only are there different types of collectibles, different types of stories behind those collectibles, great people like the relationships. I mean, all those things I've benefited from all those things at, at past nationals. And I'm, I'm probably the most excited for the, all of the above, the relationships, the collectibles, the cards, everything that I love. But I think I, I also think about learning. I think about how much I've learned being at the national for the last two years and how much I know I'm going to learn again in Cleveland this year. And I know our audience loves learning. I love learning. I could tell you do as well, just because of the, the sure. kind of the trajectory path that your career has taken. And um, so, so I think, you know, learning more about whether, whether it's about what's coming down the pike in the industry, whether it's about some history behind a collectible, whether it's learning a new story from someone, I'm just excited for all of that. And, um, you know, be before I ask you some more questions about the national, I think one thing our audience might be wondering, and I'm kind of wondering too, I know you do a lot of the PR, a lot of the promotions for the national Talk a little bit, if you can, about like maybe some of the people behind the event. Like, what exactly is your role, and then who are some of, who are some of your colleagues that you know may, maybe uh, make sense to kind of mention for who who puts this massive, phenomenal, fun event together every year? Well, I'll start out by saying we have a board of directors. Uh, Al Dorso is a new president. I say new; he he was elected in Atlantic City. Uh, and Al does a great job and he oversees uh, the board and his responsibility is to go out there and secure, you know, management groups um, at, at an appropriate time and place. And we have a new management group in there now. It's called the JBJ uh, Corporation, but it's made up of uh, Joe Dralick, Jimmy Ryan, Brian Coppola. Um, who have experience. The, these guys, uh, they've been exhibitors at the National uh, for quite some time, but they also, you know, they, they've managed other shows. I mean, Joe handles and manages uh, the Philly show and CSA. He works with uh, CSA on the floor. And, um, you know, Brian and Jimmy run the East Coast National. So they have experience. And I met with them in Atlantic City uh, when it was known that they were going to be the new managers. And, and we had a great meeting. And I was just, you know, taken back by their excitement, their passion, their vision, their, you know, how much they cared for the exhibitor and the industry. And, and it was one of those things that, you know, you know, it was refreshing. I mean, it was great. And so I, you know, they asked me if I would hang out, stand, come back. And uh, I said, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was sold. And, um, and so, you know, my role is really to kind of take the, you know, the, the, the marketing slash promotion and kind of maximize opportunities and create that awareness uh, work with I, I work with a lot of the sponsors uh, in terms of engagement and uh, exposure, whether it's social media, whether it's appearances. And, uh, you know, I did that all by myself for like 13 years. And this year, I'm fortunate to have uh, two people that have joined my team, uh, Christy Aya and uh, Alex Manguel. Uh, who both have experience and they've kind of allowed me to kind of do what I wanted to do. And, and now that I have, you know, the strength behind me um, to de develop relationships. And you know, I've, I've been on the phone the last few days with mainstream media at uh, Cleveland, you know, talking about what we're, you know, what we're planning, what we're, you know, some of the ideas we have, some of the excitement that can be had, you know, whether it's there for their viewers or listeners. And, and for me, that, I enjoy that. I enjoy putting together, you know, deals. I, in, in, in deals that are kind of a win-win situation, you know, because the people of Cleveland, the people of Ohio are, you know, if you haven't witnessed this, and uh, I was telling a, a gentleman from Fox 8 today at a Cleveland, I said, you know, there was this one anchor that basically was, uh, he, he's legendary in Cleveland. His name was Munch, nicknamed Munch. 
And I took him to the national in 2018. And he was just like, unbelievable. It was like, it's just something you can't imagine. And so for me, I love that uh, response. I, I mean, I love to bring people into the fold. And, and uh, in this year, I think mostly <laughs> based on the strength of the industry, uh, my job is a little bit easier in the sense that, you know, I've, I've approached the Cleveland Browns, the, the, the Cleveland Cavs, the Guardians, and, you know, they all, they all understand it. They, uh, it's not for me. I don't have to explain to them what the national is. I don't have to explain to them what create, uh, uh, collecting is all about. And uh, so we, we're going to have some really cool stuff coming from all three. Um, and uh, with our media partners and, and then working with the hobby, you know, the hobby uh, media, whether it's a podcaster or a content creator. Um, one of the greatest things that, that I've felt was warranted and also that was successful was, I don't know if you remember, years ago, people were saying, well, we need to get kids, more kids into the hobby. And that was a mantra. And so we were actually, through fate, was able to hook up with Brody the Kid. Now, Brody the Kid is much older today, but at the time, maybe four or five years ago, he was a young kid. And, and I, you know, we, we talked about a relationship. We talked about, you know, how he, how he could have a role in not only promoting the national, but promoting the industry. And he got it, he understood it, and he took it upon himself. He went out there and his voice spoke to kids. His voice spoke to the manufacturers. His voice spoke to the media. And all of a sudden now, you know, everybody is coming on board, you know. All the manufacturers are doing, you know, giveaways and pack wars and, and, and the kids were involved and Brody was, you know, he was the guy. I mean, he was the, 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 the person that basically kind of stimulated all this. And from there, we, you know, obviously going forward in society or even in our industry, we have challenges. And so for us, you know, there's a lot of things and I won't go into all of them, but there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. And so we started forming a, an ambassador group. Uh, Doc Collectible was one of my you know, first choices uh, after Brody. And from there, it's grown to where we have people what I call, they're not necessarily influencers, they're content creators. And they, they are able to get the message out there. And one of the things that I've always, you know, I go to bed, I go, you know what, I hope we reach some people today so that they understand it so that they can come and enjoy it. Because it's hard to explain to somebody just off the street what, you know, what 600,000 square feet at the IX Center is going to bring. Because it's just, I mean, it's people hear a card show and then they think you know a much smaller version and and it's not it's an experience it's much bigger it's it's a happening and so for me to for these content creators to go out there and speak on behalf of the industry that we have a, a forum uh, every year uh, annually that people can come and they can learn, they can edu get educated, they can enjoy it, their entertainment, they can do all the above. And, uh, you know, you, you don't even necessarily have to be a collector to come to the National. I can't tell you how many people I've, I've met or, or dealt with that, you know, just come for the, for the people. You know, they just love meeting people, love watching people, having conversations, you know, talking about your team, talking about, you know, that player, you know, in the TriStar Autograph Pavilion. You know, we've got 125 of them signing. Um, you know, the, a lot of that brings up, you know, great conversations and, and uh, new relationships. And they rekindle the old relationship. So uh, we do that. Um, you know, one of the exciting things, and and uh, and, I, I, and I speak about this all the time. One of the exciting things we did was, you know, create a, a, a trade show, a trade night um, in Atlantic City uh, with um, with Ryan and Jim. Uh, um, who basically did a great job and and we brought it in 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 house and this year in cleveland we're going to have three trade nights uh thursday friday and saturday and uh i don't know if you were at the trade night last night uh, last year paul but we had like five thousand people uh at the trade night now when i say five thousand i mean we have a room 
and we have X amount of space and for, for attendees, we had to rotate that space. And there was a line, so when somebody came, came out, somebody went in, and, and they calculated to be about 5,000 people. And so and it was a highlight. And so we're doing that three times this year. And we're adding, you know, it's, it's like anything else. You know, when, when you have an event, you always want to think, how do we better this event? You know, what can we make, what can we do to make this more experiential, more entertaining, uh, more interactive? And, and, and obviously we do that. And so this year you're going to see a little different approach. Um, whereas when you go into a trade night, you're going to have, you know, different things to consider in terms of, you know, checking out. And, uh, and I don't want to get into too many details, but it's going to be exciting. And it's going to be one of the, one of the again, one of the highlights uh, for the five day show. As if we weren't already super excited for the 2024 National in Cleveland, I think we're all even more excited just listening to you uh, give us your overview and, and your passion for the event. I mean, I love everything you just said. I think from from the stewardship that you're kind of taking in, you and your team and your colleagues putting together this event, uh, helping get the word out to people outside of the hobby. Like you mentioned, some news acres in Cleveland, some more traditional media that that might not be as familiar with the hobby. But then what's cool is you're talking about like the Cleveland Browns, the, the Cavs, other, you know, other sports related entities that aren't directly related to the hobby. You're saying now they have this extremely high awareness of the hobby itself and they understand what's going on. To me, those two things are indicators of, okay, the national is in a position to really, really do good things for the hobby and grow the ho grow the hobby in a good way, and and that it is happening right now. And then, of course, you mentioned I like how you segued into the hobby media because I think that that people in our audience understand that there is hobby media, but not everybody understands that. And so I can imagine from your seat, that's a relatively new thing, right? Like Brody the Kid, Doc Collectible, others. Um, hopefully one day the sports card strategy show, we'll see, I'll be, I'll be lobbying you offline for that. Maybe how we can, how we can partner. But I think that like for a normal card show, that's not the national, the goals and objectives would be more, let's fill the tables. Let's get sponsors. Let's make this event work. The national obviously is totally different than that. The national is at a different level. You guys are thinking, Yes, you know, we're not going to have any problems filling the tables. In fact, there's a, you know, there's a wait list a mile long for that and probably for the, the corporate boost, the sponsorships, things like that. Sure. So when you talked about the goals of the national, I love the way that you broke everything down to the point where like, yes, we're acknowledging that we need to be doing those things. We can't overlook those basic things. Otherwise, we're, you know, we, we risk slipping and not improving ourselves, but really we're at a juncture where we can be again sort of stewards of the hobby to the rest of the world as well as kind of lifting up and continuing to promote the people within the hobby so um that i think like that was one thing that i kind of wanted to learn from you in this conversation and so far that's my takeaway but do you have any anything to add to that in terms of just kind of as the hobby grows what are the top goals of the national and um you know anything else you want to share right well, I think, you know, when people ask me what gets me excited, um, and I do get excited, trust me, like I, when I go, I usually get in on Tuesday. Um, and when I get to the entrance of the show, even though it's all set up, I mean, it's, it, it's like a whole new world to me, a whole new experience. And, and I'm, I'm energized. I'm re I truly am. And, and then when the show opens, uh, again, but w when people ask me what most excites me, it's when I'm walking, you know, through the halls and, and down the aisles and and I see a dad, a mom, a son, a daughter, grandpa, grandma, you know, walking together or, you know, you know, segments of that. But um, we've we've evolved. We've grown. I say we, the industry uh, have grown to where, you know, you know, having a mother, having a daughter, having, you know, grandpa, grandma, you know, as part of our, you know, uh, attendees, that's, that to me is exciting. 
And, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, I think it's a lot of um, hard work on many people's part, you know, from within the industry. Uh, obviously, the national takes it very seriously. And um, but, you know, obviously with pop culture and Pokemon and our international um, uh, interests, uh, it does open it up. And but once it opens it up, you got to cater to it and you've got to address it. You got to recognize it. And I think that's what we do. And, and um, I'll give you one example, is, uh, which I'm very excited about, is, you know, we have Cheryl Miller coming in. Uh, we'll be signing in the TriStar Autograph Pavilion. We have the 1999 USA Women's National Soccer Team coming in. Um, that, for me, is exciting because uh, I can't tell you how many young girls and, and teenagers, uh, you know, mostly female, but they will come in. And, and that interaction, that recognition is just so awesome, so, so inspiring. Um, and, you know, so <laughs> I always kid, uh, now, now the sister and the brother have something, you know, that connects them, engages them. And, 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 and in a bigger level, you know, there was a, there was a scenario when the dad was looking at a Mickey Mantle jersey and his son, and he was telling the son how, you know, hey, you know, that was my idol. And the, and the kid just poked on his uh, sleeve and he said, no, dad, no, dad, that was Judge. You know, Judge is, a, is the GOAT. And the fact that these guys connected, it, it wasn't about, you know, Mickey Mantle. It wasn't about trading cards. It wasn't about the national. It was about a dad and a son connecting on something that they can treasure forever. And, you know, for me, that's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think my perspective on this is that there's so many different things in the hobby for everyone. Um, the hobby is more than just collecting. It's more than just transacting. Um, it's more than just the stories. It's more than just the relationships. It's really whatever you want it to be. And I mean, I think what we do here at the Sports Card Strategy Show, I think is very different than what a lot of other hobby content creators do in that we come out and say, like, we're, we're going to help you make smart decisions. We're going to actually put out content that helps you make money as you're, as you're transacting throughout the hobby so that we can help keep people in the hobby. The reason being is most of our audience is age 35 to 55 that just want to get back into doing something fun again. And, and they have the disposable income to do it. So they're just kind of trying to figure out, you know, if I'm going to spend money in the hobby on collectibles, you know, I want to make smart decisions. And so there is something for everyone. The national is doing an amazing job um, growing that and catering to that and, and, and elevating that. And, um, I want to switch gears real quick, Ray, before, before we let you go, um, feel free to, you know, say no comment to this, but one thing, um, <laughs> what, I'm a, I'll set the stage a little bit, right? So you know where I'm coming from. And so the audience knows where I'm coming yeah. from. So on social media, everybody's kind of trying to learn what's, what's true and what's misinformation. And one of the things that's been circulating around about this year's national is this this notion of like an after show where there are where where you, there are booths for the after show you mentioned three different trade nights which i would assume is totally different than anything that could be called an after show is this after show concept real is it a myth is it something that that uh is official to the national is it a rumor do you have any idea what i'm talking about let me answer it this way paul I've been in many meetings with um, the management and and others, and uh, I've never heard of the after show segment. <laughs> so. I love it. Well, I had I had to ask the the official source here. So, good good answer, good answer. I appreciate that. Right. And look, I mean, here's here's my thing. You know, there's so much going on that's phenomenal about the national that like this going into my third year, I've had to like pare down the stuff that I've had on my calendar during that week, just so that I, because there's so much going on that it's like, you know, my advice to everybody out there who might be getting really excited about what Ray and I are talking about, but have never gone to a national. My advice is like, 
don't plan anything else on your calendar. Just go and like, just take it all in if it's your first time. And it's taken me three years to try to figure that out. So I'm kind of relieved that you haven't heard of this after show thing because it's one less thing that I have to try to figure out if I need to do or not. But anyway, I'm super excited. Ray, uh, Schulte, thank you so much for joining us on the Sports Card Strategy Show here on the NoOffSeason.com Sports Card Network. I'm a fan of yours. I'm a fan of what you guys are doing. Uh, we're all here to help support you in, in any way we can, and and I look forward to seeing you soon. Is there anything else you want to say before I let you go, man? No, I, I just hope to see everybody out in Cleveland. And uh, if you need more information, just go to our website, uh, nsccshow.com. It's got all the information you need. You can buy admission tickets. You can buy autograph tickets. And follow us on Instagram, uh, NSCC Show. Um, and uh, collab with us. If you're going to the show and you want to collab with us, you've got my invitation. So please do so. I will vouch for what Ray just said. I mean, as, as intimidating as it may seem to a first-timer interacting with the National, not only is Ray super approachable, but you know the rest the rest of the the rest of his coworkers colleagues all the people behind the scenes the show itself super approachable super friendly um so t totally want to want to vouch for that and uh just thanks again for joining us man I'll, we'll see you soon thank you paul thanks for having us all right got to be pumped about the national 2024 in Cleveland coming up in just a few weeks. We're going to be there. I can't wait. Thanks again for Ray Schulte for being on the Sports Card Strategy Show today. We're here to make you help you make money flipping sports cards. I'm Paul Hickey. For everyone else at NoOffSeason.com, have a great day. Thanks so much for being here with us on the Sports Card Strategy Show. To connect with us further, please subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. Please also give us a follow on Instagram at Sports Card Strategy and on X at No Off Season Card. We also have a Discord that you could join at sportscardstrategy.com. Everyone, I'm Paul Hickey. For the rest of us here at NoOffSeason.com, have a great day. We'll see you again soon.